Welcome back to our special Inside the Issues. We're going to take a look now at one of America's most distinctive and now endangered rights, the right to bear arms. America is an unusual country in a number of ways, but one way that this country stands out is our much stronger firearms culture. America has more firearms than people, probably more civilian-owned guns per capita than any other country in the world. And unlike almost any other country, gun ownership is constitutionally protected here. Why is that? Well, a brand new book explores America's long relationship with firearms. David Harsani wrote that book. It's entitled First Freedom, A Ride Through America's Enduring History with the Gun. And he joins us now in studio. David, thanks very much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So the core question first, why is gun ownership constitutionally protected in the United States? Well, for two reasons. There's ideological reasons. It's a natural right to be able to protect yourself, your family, your property. And it is the most important right because without it, obviously, none of the others exist. Why is it obvious? What does that mean? Well, it's obvious because if uh, the people who fought at Concord and Lexington, they weren't fighting over income inequality. They were fighting because people were coming to take their weapons and thus they could have taken their property or their other rights if they had yes. those weapons. Yeah. So without a gun, Powerful people can make you obey. You're only independent if you can defend yourself. Well, yeah, it's an authoritarian idea to try to take the means of protection away from the individual. Right. But we're told that it's actually a way to protect the rest of us from one another, taking our guns away. Do you think there's another motive at work? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an authoritarian motive. I think how people treat the right to self-defense tells us a lot about how they think about the state itself. America's built, obviously, on individual rights. The Bill of Rights are individual rights, not right. collective rights. And um, so that goes for guns, of course, as, as it does for free speech and everything else. So I think those people, yeah, they, I, I don't think they respect any of the rights in the Bill of Rights, actually. Huh. So the instinct to take people's guns away is much bigger, you're arguing, than just the desire to protect Well, from law-abiding citizens, right. obviously, you know, there are people who break those laws, and most of the, most of the laws that come in, you know, that are, that are being pushed in California and elsewhere right now, and nationally when Obama was president, is a collective punishment for the people who already break laws that exist. They don't really bring down gun crime in any way. So the implication of a lot of the arguments you hear is that America has more mass shootings because there are more guns. Do we have more guns per capita than we once had? It's hard to quantify per capita, but obviously there was a huge, in the 90s, there was a, a big dip in crime. For the next 30 year, 25 years, there was a big dip in crime, but yet gun ownership spiked at the same time. So um, we don't, you know, obviously there are many factors in play when you're talking about that, but certainly you can't blame, you know, if more people have guns, there should be more crime if that theory held. So it's not true that the more guns a community holds, the more violent crime. I mean, there's no, there's not, you know, you look at Chicago or Washington, D.C., and compare it to a town in Texas where everyone has a gun. I mean, it's pretty clear that that's not the case. So what would the case, I mean, I, I think your book is, is, is pro-Second Amendment. What would the case be that you would make to someone who does not own a gun but is sort of on the fence uh, on, the, on that question? Well, I think there's two, the book's about the culture of guns, which is more than just an ideological question. It's embedded in the culture of America, in, in the way we do commerce, in the way we, we tame the West, and many other ways it was part of the DNA of our, right. our, our nation. So that's the first thing, and I think that's why many Americans feel about guns the way they do, which is very unique compared to any other nation. Um, but to, to change someone's mind, I guess you have to, you know, about guns themselves and ownership of guns, you have to explain to them how guns help them protect their property and their family right. and their rights. Um, and that, even if all the laws they wanted were passed, there would still be viol gun violence. In fact, we don't know that there would be any less gun violence than we have today. But what we do know is that you would be less able to protect yourself from the state or from other individuals who want to hurt you. So really quickly, the, you, often, you, you said the history and the premise of your book is that the history of the gun is embedded in the history of this country. That's widely acknowledged but often derided as a bad thing. The well, cowboy culture is the problem. You think that's true? No, I mean, th but there's a huge revisionist uh, effort to make, it, to make it seem as if guns weren't as important in our history as it were, because that ties into the politics of today. And, you know, there have been books, there are books even now coming out where, where, where historians make the case that guns weren't important in American life, that it was a collective right, never thought of as an individual right. And hopefully in my book I dispel that notion and debunk it. I think this is really at the center of a lot of our debates, in, in, even when it's not mentioned. And I'm grateful that you wrote this book. Thank right, you. Thanks for having me, and thank you. Of course.